one command, husbands, love your wives. Nothing about authority there, nothing about dominance, nothing about ruling, nothing about subjecting, nothing about commanding. Husbands, love your wives. In this video, Vodi Bukam talked about the submitting role of the wife in marriage. And in the comment section, many people requested that we also share something about the role of the husband in marriage. In this video, John MacArthur explains the biblical role of the husband in marriage. I kindly request you to watch this video until the end and please feel free to share your thoughts down below in the comment section. To support us on this channel, please make sure that you hit the subscription button and please like this video so that YouTube can suggest it to more people. Thank you. Let me read chapter 5 of Ephesians starting in verse 22 and down through verse 33. This is the divine design and order for a marriage that can be, in spite of fallenness, a grace of life. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reverence to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Now backing up to verse 18, just to remind you, those who are Spirit-filled, verse 18, filled with the Spirit, those who are joyful worshipers, verse 19, those who are constantly thankful, verse 20, and those who are mutually submissive are the ones who are going to enjoy the richness of marriage as the grace of life. Last week we talked about the wives. This week I want to pick it up at verse 25 and the duty of the husband. And it's so simple and impossible to misunderstand one command, husbands love your wives. Nothing about authority there, nothing about dominance, nothing about ruling, nothing about subjecting, nothing about commanding. Husbands, love your wives. That defines the kind of headship in a marriage that God desires. Obviously, it's never abusive, it's never overbearing, it's never inconsiderate, it's never thoughtless, it's never harsh, it's never unkind, because it is defined as love. And this is the highest and noblest of loves. The verb is agapao, that love which is the love of the will, which transcends all other loves, which by its own nature is selfless and sacrificial. So husbands, it's pretty simple. The responsibility is to love your wives. That's, that's the command. And this is to be generated by the husband. Understand, the command is to the husband to love. It says nothing about the wife, whether she's lovable or not, or whether she's occasionally lovable, or rarely lovable, or never lovable. It doesn't change the command because the command is to love your wives. 
And that is the reality. And the, the kind of love, again, is the highest and noblest and purest and best love. Now, let's define that, and uh, we'll allow the Spirit of God to do that for us in a way that is just really overpowering. What do you mean, love your wives? Oh, this is what I mean. Verse 25, just as Christ also loved the church. Wow, that sets the standard pretty high. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. What kind of love was that? Well, he proved his love for us while we were enemies. He loved us when we were unlovable. He loved us when we were rebellious. He loved us when we were full of hatred. He loved us when we were wretched, vile, sinful. That's the kind of love. This is not love that is won by the object. This is love that is given in spite of the failures of the object. Chrysostom, the golden mouth preacher in the fourth century church, wrote this, hear the measure of this love. If it be needful that you should give your life for her or be cut to pieces a thousand times or endure anything whatever, refuse it not. Christ bought his church and brought his church to his feet by his great love, not by threats nor any such thing. So do you conduct yourself toward your wife. He understood exactly what this is saying. Love your wife? How? How do I love my wife? What do you mean by that? I mean, love your wife as Christ also loved the church. That's the model and that's the pattern and no less than that. Now, this is just stunning in the context of the people of Ephesus and the Roman world because Roman law basically treated women as if they were slaves. They were less than human. In fact, Cato, writing Roman law, says this, if you were to catch your wife in an act of infidelity, you may kill her without a trial. But if she were to catch you, she would not venture to touch you with her finger. She has no such right. Oh, well, that's the role of women in ancient Rome. So what God is saying through the Apostle Paul is shocking. Love your wives and love them as Christ also loved the church. This sets the standard so high. There are several considerations with regard to defining this love over in 1 Peter 3. If you look at it for just a moment, 1 Peter 3, 7. You get a little more insight into it, and we looked at this briefly last week. You husbands, in the same way, and th these are some of the ways that love expresses itself, Live with your wives first in an understanding way. This love demands understanding, knowledge, some translations say, knowing her sensitivity, knowing her feelings, knowing her needs. This, this is not uh, some macho, independent, um, insensitive kind of dominance that we're talking about, but rather it is living in a way that displays the fact that you are in touch with the depth of her understanding, her feelings, her thoughts, her desires. Secondly, it calls not only for such consideration, but even for chivalry, as with someone weaker since she is a woman. Not weaker intellectually, not weaker in terms of wisdom, not weaker in any spiritual sense, but by God's design, man is stronger. He is the protector. He is the provider. He is the source of security and strength in the union. She should know that. She should feel protected. 
She should feel secure. You are her knight in shining armor. And then thirdly, not only consideration and a measure of chivalry, but you should show her honor. So this love encompasses showing honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. In other words, you're treating her like a believer. You're treating her uh, like it's the communion of the saints. This is my beloved, my friend, it says in Song of Solomon. And that's the kind of expression. This is my beloved. This is my friend. We are heirs together of the grace of life. We, we share commonly in the grace that God has extended to us in Christ and by which He has brought us together in this union. So we are to love our wives in a, a way that expresses the understanding of who they are, expresses their need for strength and security, and expresses the common communion as heirs together in the kingdom of God so that we defer as we would to any other believer, Philippians 2, considering others better than ourselves. That's how you treat each other in the kingdom. So this is the biblical definition. We are to love in the way Christ loved the church. Go back to Ephesians and, uh, in chapter 5, and I want to kind of break out what Paul says here. It's very simple. So what does it mean to love the way Christ loved the church? Okay, he's going to tell us. First, verse 25. He gave himself up for her. He gave himself up for her. That's where it starts. It is self-sacrificing loves. The, the Spirit-filled husband loves his wife, not for what she can do for him, but for what he can do for her. That kind of love seeks only her joy, only her fulfillment, only her spiritual benefit. That's how that love works, and that's the way Christ loved, right? Philippians chapter 2, he didn't hold on to what he had in glory, equality with God, but he took on the form of a servant, humbled himself to death, even death on the cross. Why did he do that? It was condescending sacrifice for the objects of his divine love. A real love is never tyrannical. A real love is always sacrificial. This is a Christ-like love. You have to find every possible way that you can demonstrate setting yourself aside for the sake of your spouse. It's love that is that selfless. In John, a couple of passages in John 13, there was a, an upper room uh, moment where Jesus had uh, expressed His love. John 13 begins Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the max. He, he, he had maximum love for them. They weren't very lovable. They were all arguing about who was going to be greatest in the kingdom. Uh, nobody wanted to disqualify himself by washing somebody else's feet. Uh, they all thought they were too good for that, so they didn't do that, which was a common courtesy that should have been done uh, before a, such an event, such a dinner. And because they refuse to do it, Jesus steps up, and you know the story. He, he washed their feet. He humbled himself to wash their feet. And at, toward the end of the 13th chapter in verse 34, he says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. What, what, what was the way in which he had just loved them? by washing their feet. That's what he's referring to. Even as I have loved you, you love one another. And then he says, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And what he means by that is the definition of love is humble service to someone else, selfless sacrifice for someone else. Over in John 15, on that same occasion, verse 13, Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that one lays down his life for his friend. So it starts out, love washes someone's feet, and then love gives up its own life. Peter calls it ectonase love, stretched love. It stretches as far as it needs to to embrace its object. 
It really involves the death of self. This is the key to a good marriage, is the death of self, particularly the death of self in the husband, so that he is characterized by the love that is defined in Scripture in 1 Corinthians 13. You remember this, right? Love is patient. Think of this in your marriage. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Okay, that's divine love. That's the kind of love that's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit through salvation, and that is how a husband is to love his wife. And by the way, all of those things that I read out of 1 Corinthians 13 are verbs, verbs, not static nouns. He's not describing love as if you could take a snapshot. He's showing it as if it's a video. It's a way of life. It's help, help and humble service as a continual flow of life. That's how husbands are to act toward their wives. Just pulling out one, uh, one of those characteristics in verse 5, love does not seek its own. It does not seek its own. In the language of Philippians 2, considers other better than itself. So when a man is spirit-filled, when, when a man is filled with joyful praise, when a man is characterized by constant thankfulness, when a man has a submissive heart, he will love his wife enough to sacrifice for her, to sacrifice for her continually. So this softens the authority that the Lord is talking about when He says wives are to submit, because they are submitting to one who totally sacrifices himself to lead them and provide for them. Mm -hmm. 